Good morning. This is Randall Ward, Director of Student Activities, and we're here this morning to celebrate uh, Women's History Month. And in celebrating Women's History Month, we have some of our faculty and staff members here today uh, that will help us with this interview that we're going to conduct this morning with Ms. Carol Mulready. So uh, before we begin, I'm just going to start with our panel uh, today. Uh, can you all please introduce yourselves? Oh, um, hello, I am oh, Antoinette Brimbell, and I am a professor of English at Capital Community College and the chair of Center for Good morning, I'm Professor White, and I'm the co-chair for the Committee for um, Diversity and Inclusion. Happy to be here. Welcome, everyone. Hi, my name is Rocio Techo. I am the Enrollment Services Coordinator at Capital Community College. Thank you once again, everyone. Good morning. And once again, we're celebrating Women's History Month here at Capital Community College. And our guest from the League of Women Voters in the Greater Hartford area, uh, area is uh, Carol Mulready. And what we'll do now is start uh, some questions that we have for her because she has such an interesting background and we need to learn a lot more about uh, women in voting, women in politics. So this is what this conversation is all about and Carol will help us kind of dissect some of that uh, history to this morning with her wealth of knowledge. So uh, we'll start uh, with our panel. Uh, Rocio will ask our first question and good morning once again, everybody. Hi, good morning again. Um, I, the first question would be, what is the League of Women um, Voters? Uh, the League of Women Voters is a 101-year-old organization. Uh, some of um, the students watching this may um, remember that 2020 um, had some significant advertising, programming for 100 years of suffrage. And that uh, was the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the League of Women Voters. Um, on Valentine's Day of 2021, we were 101 and continued to do the work of engaging voters to um, educate voters so that they can be um, cognizant of what the issues are in their communities and in the nation and be effective voters. The League um, is nonpartisan. But it's also political. Some people don't think those two go together, but that can be so because what the league does in its political uh, activity has nothing to do with individual candidates nor parties. We support policies, we support issues. Um, this league studies issues um, extensively, writes up. Um, the criteria for why it was studied and how it was studied and sh and shares the pros and cons in these study groups and then nationwide after these studies are completed takes a consensus agreement there's not an up and down voting it's a consensus of the room if you will uh, to uh, establish this position on something like voting rights, which are very important in this climate. Um, and then using that word climate, climate change, um, clean water, women's rights, um, and, and on and on. There are at least 50, I think there are 50 positions that have been extensively studied. Um, we do work to influence our elected officials so we that that's our advocacy role in um, working for positions that benefit all the people in the country after these studies have occurred that's basic outline we also are local state and national there's one membership fee and that money is shared among all the groups national being the primary because of the uh, hiring of lobbyists. But for the most part, the League is a volunteer organization. Um, people are not paid at the local level to do the work that 
is required to sustain this organization for as long as it has been in place. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Carol, thank you so much for sharing that information uh, with us. And happy birthday to the league. Yeah, yeah, it's quite an accomplishment. Um, and there is a, a very nice thing if anybody wants to go to lwvct.org. That's the state league's site. There's a video on there called Marching in Their Footsteps that has a, a, a nice, quick little, well, it's a, not a short video, but it's got the a lot of the women who did things during the 100 years preceding suffer, uh, preceding the vote, getting the vote, um, and how we got there. Very interesting. And then a little bit of some of the women that worked to continue to, to make the education of the voters who had now gotten voting rights for the first time uh, to, to learn how to vote. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting video. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that resource uh, with us. Now, down the same uh, lane of questioning, uh, what is the mission of the League and why was it created? And why was it created? Okay. Um, the, the mission is to empower voters and to defend democracy, basically. Uh, in order to do that, we have to educate ourselves. And just as I mentioned with the studies that we do, that's part of the um, method of educating. We also put uh, other education panels together that may not necessarily be part of our, our own positions, but that it becomes something that's very important um, in the time. An example, um, this year before the legislature, there is a bill um, from the House that is a, um, working to, it's called Aid in Dying for the Terminally Ill. And this, the League does not have a position on, but we created an education program for that, um, that brought in experts. And so that's one of our other um, ways of helping the public analyze a, a subject. Um, as I said earlier, we we work to influence policy by lobbying legislators. We can testify before the legislature. We can testify in our town councils and boards of education. In Hartford, in 2021, the election is going to be for the Board of Education. So any students that are part of Hartford um, and grew up in Hartford might be interested in watching that election and finding out who those candidates are. and. Uh, our league here is uh, working with a group called Hartford Votes that is trying to engage Hartford voters. And that I, I invite your, your students to consider joining that. We have a youth engagement piece to that. Um, it's a large coalition that's centered um, online right now. You know, we do all our meetings online. Um, sometimes we write editorials. Um, we, when we do that in the name of the league, we have to be doing it with the policy positions that we have. It has to be based on those things. We cannot testify as a league without having a position. You can, as an individual, without naming the league, testify for anything you want if you are supporting an issue. But if you're testifying for the league, you know, you want to keep it. Um, Within the within the confines of our position. Um, now, how did it get or why did it start? Prior to 1920, there was about a hundred years, maybe longer, really, of the suffrage suffrage movement to get women the vote. I bet many of the young people do not did not realize that women did not have the vote. We were the last ones to get the vote. Men had it, property owners, but even female property owners could not vote, except in very, very select things within small communities when they were property owners. 
after the Civil War, I think it was in 1870s, um, the 14th Amendment gave the freed slaves the right to vote, but only the men. So in 1920, after the battles where women marched, they were arrested, they were tortured, um, they were, uh, you know, just attacked really by the other half of the population to try to prevent women from getting power. And those women, there are some wonderful stories about what they did um, to bring us to the uh, 1920 um, a suffrage, acceptance of the suffrage of the 19th Amendment. So that is when all women got the right to vote. Unfortunately, as you probably know, there were um, activities outside of that granting of the vote that didn't allow people, especially people of color, to use that vote that they were granted. There were state laws that minimized the opportunity. And the League did not have a position on that. Um, we do now, but at the time there was there was nothing to um, allow the League to uh, do it. And that's a that's a whole nother whole nother story. But why it was established was to take advantage of now they are able to vote. But the women that marched knew that those had, who had not been involved and were now going to have the vote needed to be educated. And that transition from the women's suffrage movement, and there were a couple of different organizations, two, three, four, across the country, uh, transitioned to the League of Women Voters in order to uh, create a new mission and a continuing mission to uh, get all of the electorate involved in, in voting for the legislation that was proposed. That's basically why. This is so interesting. Um, so could you explain how does it work as a political organization? Okay, so when we take that word advocacy, um, and you have some background information uh, that has been studied and you've seen the pros and cons and you have it in front of you, you take that information, you take the, as, as members of the league and whatever group within your local league, state or national, uses that information and current information to um, send out information in multiple ways you know today it's many different ways to help people to understand what's going on also very important in these days is to be a, a collaborator with many other groups so there are we we join with a lot of other groups like common cause to name one um, on the voting rights issues that are before us now we we have our state league um, has a lot of good information on its site about what's going on at the legislature now, what what our priorities are. So there's a lot of communication involved with that to inform the public. Um, the members at any level often can drive what's being addressed. Um, we establish our priorities every year at the local and national level. There are conventions and so forth that um, occur. And always we try to speak with one voice. So if, for example, I wanted to testify at um, one of the one of the pieces that's before the legislature on the voting rights, the early voting that's before the legislature, why why should Connecticut be able to vote early? I would coordinate with the the state league to make sure I'm not saying anything or repeating what they're saying unnecessarily. And I can always add my name to what the state representatives who are going to lobby. Oftentimes, a local person such as myself would be asked to present the testimony for the state league. So that's that's part of it. 
Um, so members can be influential. They also can be helpful and you always need feet on the ground, as they say, for um, informing people and sending out on your personal Facebooks or uh, social media pieces to uh, keep letting people know what's going on. And that a piece of legislation is coming up and you need to call, write, or email your legislator. And it's made very easy today to let them know what you have on your mind. If you go to Common Cause or the State League or to a CBIA, Connecticut Business and Industry Association, they have a very good um, site for finding out who your representative is and you can send a message very quickly from their site. You do not have to send it from your own computer, you know, looking them up on the state site, but you can. The Connecticut General Assembly, cga.ct.org, um, takes you to the portal where you can find out um, how to find a bill and track it and then keep nudging your legislators about your preference for where that bill is going up or down you know at the legislature so there's a whole stream of activity throughout the legislative session which this year goes from january 9th to like june 6th something like that so it's a long session but right now is the testimony time now and through april and then they start working amongst themselves to um do it so that's how you know, most of the advocacy works. And I can give you a little story of um, how a fun one rather than the, you know, a, a long trail uh, of picking an issue. So this was kind of a fun issue that happened after World War II, right here in Connecticut. Um, you know what oleomargarine is, and it's yellow, right? It substitutes for butter. and in in World War II, there was a shortage of dairy, and they came up with this substitute. And in Connecticut, this substitute was white in color. So not very appealing as a substitute for butter. In New Hampshire, one of our members would visit the family up there. Their oleomargarine was yellow. So there was a movement in Connecticut, and this was happening in other states across the country as well, to get the um, oleomargarine to be yellow. Why couldn't it be yellow? Well, because the dairy industry had a very strong lobbying group in the state in the in the state house area of uh, at the capital at the capital, and they fought and paid money, paid advertising to keep it white so people would not use margarine instead of butter. So that that incident, um, you know, irritated people who wanted it yellow and knew it was yellow in other places. So what the oleo margarine companies had to do was add a, a yellow packet that you could mix into the oleo mar to the white margarine yourself. And you know, pain in the neck, right? So in our area, we had this wonderful activist person, Miriam Butterworth, who lived until she was 100, a little over 100. And she, she had a good voice. She was very articulate. She was very active. And so our league asked her to testify before the legislature on this issue. Now, take her name, Butterworth, right? Very interesting. So there was a reporter who caught this whole session and picked up on the humor of it. And he said, why not, Mrs. Oleo Margarine, you, you know? And um, it did pass that we, that the, um, the margarine could be mixed and that became yellow in Connecticut and it happened across the country. So that's, that, that was people making a difference in a very relatively simple, not so important issue, but then you, you know, expand it to, you know, greater issues. So along the way, the league has a lot of fun too, you know, working with others and sometimes coming up with nice stories like this. Um, my question is, 
how can I get to know my state legislators as well as the local council or board members for my own city or town? Okay. Um, in this day and age, you put your name, put that name in the URL or the search line, almost inevitably their name will come up and you will find a, find a biography of some kind. You know, for your elected representatives at the, you know, our state and our state representatives and senators uh, through the um, state website, the uh, Connecticut General Assembly, both the Democrats and the Republicans have um, website pages. And when you do a slash with the person's name on those sites, their information will come up. So that's one way you can get general information. The other is to, um, when, when it's election time and pr prior to election, you wanna make sure that you listen and look for an opportunity to hear these people speak in, in public. At forums, there are debates, Hartford Votes, which I mentioned before, um, has been holding them in Hartford at the Hartford Public Library. Last year, um, our league held um, them, a number of debates, in, including for the first, first district to um, Washington, um, a, a debate online that worked quite well. Um, so those things are very important in, in, at the state level. In your own town, most of the council meetings are televised some way. Um, so you can look into that. You can also go live once we're able to go live to those meetings to see how those uh, people are representing you. So that's one way to to do it, but just to make sure that you are aware during the election cycle of what's going on. Thank you very much for sharing that information with us. Um, if I am interested in a particular issue, what is the best way to learn more about it? Um, if you have a particular interest, again, I, I again would search the uh, using the the web, search that topic, and find and you'll get all that list of organizations that deal with that topic. I mean, you young folks are probably a lot more facile at it than I was, but I just get, I'm getting pretty good at it and can find things in so many different ways. So you don't have to enter an organization, you enter the topic and you will find many opportunities. Some obvious ones for um, uh, getting information, you know, like voting rights. Okay, you may know about the League of Women Voters and you can go to its site. Um, Call them up and say, what can I do to help you? Common Cause is working on a lot of these voting issues right now, and they have a presence in Hartford as well as nationally. So it's that kind of thing. If you're interested in climate, the Department of Energy and um, Energy and Environmental Protection, DEEP, um, has loads of information on um, those various climate things, and they have some very, very good people um, if you have an interest in in finding out more about areas like that, DEEP will offer you a speaker to come to speak to you. And so those are resources that are there for us and that we should use. And uh, certainly talking to friends and finding out um, where your interest lies, it, it's one way to um, start to connect to a topic that's important to you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you so much for that information. As, as we're having this discussion, I am thinking, you know, what if I'm interested in politics? Uh, what would you recommend for, for me to get involved? Okay, so if you're interested, that's one thing. If you're not interested, which I wasn't, um, and yet I got involved, I became a, um, Board of Education member and a town councilor in my community. Just, just stay interested. How did I get involved? I started as a parent teacher association representative to the Board of Education in West Hartford. And going to those meetings, 
you know, finding out what was happening in my community about education. I was there a lot. So somebody asked me to run for election. I'd say, oh no, my husband said, oh, maybe that's not such a bad idea, <laughs> you know? So anyway, a lot of conversation about doing it, but um, how do you get involved if you are interested? Ask a candidate in your community if you can help run a campaign, just support a campaign, you know, putting literature door to door, helping to develop the literature, finding the printer that's going to do it. There are so many different things you can do to start learning about the process. Um, in your community, every town has um, party committees, the Democrat, Democratic Party um, leadership, the Republican Party. In Hartford, you've got uh, the Green Party. There's also um, the, um, oh gosh, it just went out of my mind, you know, family. Mm, you've got two of them on your board, uh, on your council. So the name just went out of my mind. But the, you ask those parties to, help them to to help them you know that you're offering to help them so that's a really good way to help get into a campaign and you really see the nuts and bolts of what's going on um if it's an issue oriented thing that you have going then you work with others in a group you will find your way to some kind of political activity or political elected office. So if you get involved in any of those things, it it almost it just naturally leads to it, especially if you have the interest. Um, and an example for the league is in 2021, voting, early voting, and no excuse absentee voting are very uh, significant pieces of legislation that's being uh, forwarded and the activity is um you know kind of interesting because it's it's involved it involves a constitutional amendment so there are a lot of different rules you learn about and then another thing that the league is involved in that's a very interesting one which ties to environment is the bottle bill which hasn't been changed since 19 in the 70s sometime and there's definitely more that's needed to advance that industry of recycling um, and keeping the environment clean. Um, and, and so, you know, you, you follow that and you testify and you're involved. This is so interesting. So how can I find out what bills are currently being proposed in uh, the Connecticut General Assembly? Okay, so again, you can go to the Connecticut General Assembly site, um, and that you know the C the CGA dot CT dot gov is that is that site, and you there there will be um, a list of things that you can you can search, and one of them will be bill information, and when you click on that, it will lead you to several categories under bill information where you can find what the bills are. You can also uh, tag bill tracking so you can follow a bill that you want to see. Um, and then if you belong to an organization like um, the League or Common Cause, they target certain le pieces of legislation and will email you to let you know that they're coming forward. But their sites also, you know, give constant information. The League of Women Voters has an active presence for doing stuff like that too. Um, but that that Connecticut portal will have all of uh, all of the bills that are listed. You can follow them by their number. And um, once you set yourself up in that portal, you can keep pretty good uh, track of things and fairly easily. So that's really the best way, um, you know, to to do it. Unless you're part of an organization that's studying something, and you know, you're actively involved with that. That's that would be that would be my suggestion on 
on uh, the bills. Of course, on high paper. Well, thank you, Carol. Um, on behalf of Capital Community College and our panel here today, Michelle White, Antoinette Brim, Rocio Orteco, uh, I want to thank you uh, for joining us this morning. And uh, it is a Women's History Month, and we really thank you uh, and the League of Women Voters of Great Hartford for taking the time to speaking to us and uh, providing us with all this great information. Um, and we look forward to having you again here at Capital Community College. Uh, so thank you once again. You're very welcome, Randall. Um, happy to be with you all. Nice to meet you. All right. So that concludes our presentation uh, for our Women's History Month. Uh, this is Carol Mulready. This is Randall Ward and our panel. And we hope that you all have a great day. Thank you.